You're listening to South Asia Sphere from Hima South Asia, a bi-weekly roundup of what's been happening across South Asia. This episode was recorded on 20 September 2023. Hi everyone and welcome to South Asia Sphere, our fortnightly roundup of news events and regional affairs. I'm Raisa and I'm joined by my colleague and fact checker and researcher Ritika Chauhan. Hi Raisa. Hi Ritika. So for this episode we are going to be talking about the G20 summit in Delhi and recent revelations about Sri Lanka's 2019 Easter Sunday bombings in a documentary by the UK's Channel 4. In around South Asia in 5 minutes we'll be talking about ransomware attacks in Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka the rollout of Bhutan's digital ID rising dengue cases in Bangladesh and an outbreak of the Nipah virus in Kerala a new remittance rule impacting migrant workers in Myanmar the Indian editors guild statement on Manipur and Pakistan's ex prime minister Nawaz Sharif's imminent return from exile Let's start by talking about the G20 summit. Right. The 2023 G20 summit was held on the 9th and 10th of September in New Delhi, and India was quick to claim a diplomatic win, particularly as they were able to press the members to agree to a joint declaration despite the broader backdrop of the war in Ukraine, which raised fears that consensus might not be reached for the first time. Russian President Vladimir Putin faces arrest when he travels due to a warrant issued by the International Criminal Court accusing him of war crimes in Ukraine and did not attend the summit sending his foreign minister Sergey Lavrov in his stead. The final joint declaration which is supposedly the result of over 200 hours of negotiations condemned the use of force for territorial gain in the context of the Ukraine Russia war but avoided direct criticism of Russia. to some criticism including from Ukraine's foreign ministry spokesperson Oleg Nikolenko Modi also conveyed strong concerns about anti-India protests held in Canada in a sharply worded statement Delhi has long been sensitive to the issue of pro-Khalistan Sikh protesters in Canada accusing the protesters of promoting secessionism and inciting violence against diplomats Canada's prime minister Justin Trudeau has maintained that they will always protect peaceful protests while working to combat violence and hatred tensions came to a head after the summit with trudeau saying that canada had credible information linking india to the murder of a pro khalistan sikh leader in canada hardeep singh nichar in june and expelled a senior indian intelligence official as a result worsening bilateral ties between the two countries the two countries have frozen talks on a trade deal by the end of 2023 in part due to these tensions while on the other hand during the summit the african union joined g20 as a permanent member becoming the second regional bloc to join after the european union and raising hopes that more attention would be drawn to the needs of developing economies at the summit also announced during the summit was an ambitious economic corridor linking india the middle east and europe through rail and sea European Commission president Ursula von der Leyen said that the rail link would make trade between India and Europe 40% faster. Unfortunately, the G20 members were unable to come to a consensus on climate change outcomes, committing only to triple renewable energy sources by 2030, but without an action plan on how to actually achieve this target. And while India claimed the joint declaration and the summit itself as a huge diplomatic success, the poor in delhi paid the heaviest price the government put up green curtains to cover low income neighborhoods from visitors and launched a beautification drive that led to the demolition of shops and homes while installing flowers murals lights and billboards featuring prime minister modi's face this was reported to cost over 41 billion indian rupees just under 500 million us dollars to be exact and there were reports that some 4000 homeless were shifted to shelters outside delhi and roadside vendors in shops in delhi were forced to bear 3 days of losses as they were ordered to shut for the duration of the summit schools offices and colleges were also ordered to remain shut 
In Sri Lanka, a documentary released by the British Channel 4's investigative and current affairs program, Dispatchers, claimed that the 2019 Easter Sunday bombings, which led to 269 deaths, had been partly orchestrated by military intelligence in order to bring Gotabe Rajapaksa into power as president. On Easter Sunday 2019, six suicide bombs exploded almost simultaneously across Sri Lanka. The bombers struck three churches and three luxury hotels, killing 269 people, including eight British tourists. The documentary featured testimony from Hanzir Azad Maulana, who is a former aide of Sivanesa Ture Chandrakantan, Elias Pillayan, who is leader of the political party TMVP. Now, in the documentary, Maulana has said that he arranged a meeting between the head of military intelligence, Suresh Saleh, and a group from National Tawhid Jamaat, the group who was later identified as responsible for planning and executing the Easter Sunday bombings in Putlam in February 2018. Now, while Maulana didn't attend the meeting, he claimed that Saleh told him afterwards that creating a situation of instability was the only way that Gotabe Rajpaksa could become president. Maulana said he later recognized the faces of the bombers as people who had been among this group um, during this meeting in Putlam in 2018, adding that this plan had been years in the making. Now, in response to these allegations, Former President Gotabe Rajapaksa said that the documentary was a tissue of lies and that it was an anti-Rajapaksa tirade aimed at blackening the Rajapaksa legacy. He also said that he had had no contact with Suresh Saleh from 2015 onwards. Meanwhile, Suresh Saleh himself said that he was in Malaysia at the time as a minister councillor for the government of Sri Lanka and he denied meeting with the bombers. Now, the government has said that it would appoint a parliamentary committee to investigate these allegations. There has been some attempt to provide reparations for the victims of the bombings. In January this year, Sri Lanka's Supreme Court ordered President Maitripala Sirisena to pay 100 million Sri Lankan rupees as compensation to victims of the attacks, while the former heads of the security sector, including the IGP, Secretary to the Minister of Defence, and the heads of state intelligence, national intelligence and the state itself were all collectively ordered to pay compensation totalling over 200 million rupees. But families of the victims of the Easter Sunday bombings say justice has proved more elusive. Charges were not pressed against former President Sirisena despite a presidential commission report finding that there were grounds to initiate criminal proceedings against him and some of the intelligence chiefs. The current president, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who was prime minister at the time, did not face sanction as his lawyers claimed presidential immunity at the time of the bombings. Vikramasinghe claimed to have been left out of the loop of intelligence briefings in the aftermath of a rift with then-president Maitripala Sirisena, which led to a political crisis in 2018. Now, on April 21st this year, thousands of Sri Lankans lined up along the main road connecting Colombo with the international airport. This was to mark four years since the bombings. And their slogans and key message was that the government had not done enough to deliver justice for the victims of the bombing and to punish those responsible. During the recently held UN Human Rights Council session, Deputy High Commissioner Nada Al-Nashif stressed the urgent need to establish an independent and transparent investigation into the Easter Sunday bombing with international assistance and called for the full participation of victims and their representatives. Now, we published a piece in the aftermath of the Supreme Court verdict in January this year by Rathindra Kuruvita, so do check that out in the episode notes. And now for our next segment, Around South Asia in 5 Minutes. On September 9, the Tamil Nadu police website was hacked with cyber criminals demanding USD 
20,000 to restore the website. The hackers gained access thanks to two weak passwords on the site. While the website was subsequently restored, it appears that the hackers gained access to the face recognition system database during the breach. This database contains images and details about individuals with criminal records, including repeat offenders. Police officials informed the Hindu that the incident also potentially affected a variety of e-services offered by the Tamil Nadu police, such as filing online complaints, access to press information reports, and checking the status of investigations. As it happens, the Tamil Nadu police's use of facial recognition technology is being challenged in Madras High Court due to privacy concerns, and this breach hopefully and will definitely heighten conversations around privacy issues. On the other hand, in Sri Lanka, the Sunday Times reported that the Cabinet Office and other government institutions using a gov.lk domain lost a huge amount of data due to a ransomware attack. According to the Information and Communication Technology Agency, around 5,000 email addresses were affected and lost data between 17th May to 26th August as the ransomware's encryption impacted online backups. ICTA CEO Mahesh Pereira said that the offline backups had not been maintained due to quote-unquote administrative problems. Critiques raised concerns over the future of e-government in Sri Lanka and key, as Sri Lanka is in the process of rolling out a digital ID system which has drawn criticism from privacy advocates all across the board. In July this year, Bhutan adopted the National Digital Identity Bill and is in the process of rolling out Bhutan's own digital identification system. The seven-year-old Crown Prince of Bhutan, Higme Namgyal Wangchuk, was the first to enroll in the system, and it is expected to be rolled out to the rest of the population within 2023. Now, Bhutan's digital ID system is built on blockchain technology, which the country claims allows for citizens to have a self-sovereign ID, which can be controlled only by a citizen and not any other entity. This is probably in response to the recommendations made during the debate on the Digital Identity Bill, with privacy being one of the major concerns raised. However, Bhutan maintains that it will remain in the hands of citizens to decide what data should be shared with which government entities. We've previously published articles on Nepal and Bangladesh's biometric identification systems and also the family ID system which was rolled out in Jammu and Kashmir in January 2023. Um, So it's a good time to reread those now and we'll link to those in the episode notes. Bangladesh is experiencing its most severe dengue outbreak on record according to the World Health Organization recording more than 157,000 cases and 778 deaths, according to the Bangladesh's Directorate General of Health Services, putting a huge strain on Bangladesh's health system. A WHO situation report found that 12,791 cases and 86 deaths were recorded the week of 4 September alone, an increase compared to the previous week. The spike in cases is being attributed to climate change, with the WHO noting that both climate change and El Nino's warning weather pattern contributed to dengue outbreaks in Bangladesh and South America, among other regions. In January, we published a video report on how climate change in Bangladesh was driving a dengue outbreak in winter. You can check that out in the episode notes. Bangladesh স্বাস্থ্য অধিদপ্তর বলছে যে চলতি বছর এ পর্যন্ত ডেঙ্গুতে আক্রান্ত হয়ে যারা মারা গেছেন তাদের 80 শতাংশই হাসপাতালে ভর্তির এক থেকে 3 দিনের মধ্যে মারা গেছেন নিপা অবলোকন যোগ্যতার শেষম আরোগ্য মন্ত্রী বীণা জর্জ ഇപ്പോൾ মাধ্যমങ്ങളെ കാണുകയാണ് তৎসময়ে সমরেশwidetildeলেকে Schools and offices are being shut after six cases of the rare Nipah virus were confirmed. Two people have died so far, with four more in hospital receiving treatment. All the cases have been reported in the Koikod district in northern Kerala. 
So far, containment zones have been declared throughout Koiko district and the state is testing high-risk contacts in a situation reminiscent of COVID-19 lockdowns and restrictions. Educational institutes in Koiko were ordered to shut until further notice with orders for online classes to resume. India is also in the process of procuring a monoclonal antibody from Australia for treatment of Nipah virus. There are currently no established treatments for Nipah infections. The monoclonal antibody is classed as an experimental therapeutic treatment which can be used on compassionate or potentially life-saving grounds where there is no other treatment available. The India Council for Medical Research has also said that they plan to begin work on developing a vaccine against the Nipah virus soon. The neighbouring Karnataka state government also issued a travel advisory and announced increased surveillance to avoid its spread beyond Kerala. This is to note that this is the fourth outbreak of Nipah virus since 2018. In Myanmar, the junta is demanding that expatriate workers remit 25% of their foreign currency income back to the country using the country's banking system with one of the largest private banks, CB Bank, notifying migrant workers. Those who do not comply will be barred from working overseas for three years from when their current work permits expire. Now, migrant workers will be required to open a bank account at the Central Bank of Myanmar and remit their earnings to this account. The junta's labor ministry is also offering tax incentives, saying that those who invest in Myanmar and who buy property in the country will be able to do so tax-free. Labor rights activists criticize the move as exploitative, particularly as the remittances will be converted at the official exchange rate of 2,100 kyats per US dollar compared to the market rate of 3,400 kyats. Now, this rule will certainly impact the 2 million licensed migrant workers in Thailand And it's actually reported that there's around 3 million more workers who are unlicensed. The Shadow Civilian National Unity Government urged workers not to remit funds through the official banking system as it would only go to fund the junta regime. The new rule also highlights Myanmar's increased isolation as several countries have imposed sanctions targeting individuals connected to the junta regime. Adding to this, The Southeast Asian leaders also announced that Myanmar would not be taking over the rotating leadership of their regional bloc in 2026, as was scheduled. The announcement was made at an ASEAN Leaders' Summit on September 5th, with the Philippines agreeing to take over the chairmanship instead. On September 2nd, the Editors Guild of India released a fact-finding report on the reportage of the ethnic violence in Manipur. In the report, the Editors Guild highlighted representations noting that the media was playing a partisan role in the violence, including complaints from the army corps. The fact-finding team noted, and I quote, that it was very difficult to distinguish fact from fiction with extreme pressure being exerted on journalists, whether Miti or tribal, to reflect the dominant view of their ethnic societies. The Editors Guild also highlighted the impact of the ongoing internet ban on journalists in its report, leading to difficulties in cross-checking information, and highlighted the partisan role of state leadership in responding to the ethnic violence. After the Editors Guild released the report, Manipur police filed two FIRs against office bearers in the Editors Guild accusing them of promoting enmity between different groups, defamation and criminal conspiracy among other charges under the Indian Penal Court. On September 15, India's Supreme Court extended interim protection from arrest to the four members of the Editors Guild of India who were named in the FIR, with Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachud saying that prima facie no offences could be made out against the journalists. On September 12th, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif announced that his brother, exiled former Prime Minister and leader of PMLN, Nawaz Sharif, would be returning to the country on October 21st, ending four years of exile. Now, Nawaz Sharif was serving a seven-year prison sentence in Lahore before he was allowed to travel to London in 2019 on medical grounds. 
Now, in the wake of this recent news of his return, Pakistan's Supreme Court ruled to restore corruption cases against public office holders that were withdrawn after amendments were made to Pakistan's accountability laws. Now, this verdict from the Supreme Court came in response to a petition filed by the ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan, who claimed that the amendments to the National Accountability Ordinance legitimized corruption and benefited influential people. In an interview, Pakistan's caretaker Prime Minister Anwar ul Kakar said that law enforcement agencies would decide on whether to arrest Sharif should he arrive in the country next month. Meanwhile, Shabazz Sharif told media that his brother would arrive in Pakistan on October 21st as scheduled, adding that there was no merit in the cases filed against Nawaz Sharif. Pakistan has remained impacted by continued political instability ever since Khan was ousted from his post in a no-confidence motion. Recently, in a surprise move, President Arif Alvi recommended an election date of November 6th, a move which is seen as unconstitutional as it is up to the Elections Commission to decide a date for elections. Now, the Elections Commission is in the process of declaring new boundaries, a process which has to be completed before elections can be held. And it is likely that the election date is going to be postponed. Now, this is raising concerns of military creep affecting political affairs. We've been covering various aspects of Pakistan's political and economic crisis in past episodes of South Asia Sphere, and we'll link to those in the episode notes, so do check them out. And now for our next segment, Bookmarked. Ritika, what have you been watching and what are we talking about in this episode? Well, thanks, Raisa. And I think this is going to excite some of our Bollywood-esque listeners since the movie, which we might or will be talking about, has been generating quite a buzz. And of course, no brownie points for guessing it right. So today we have on our list Jawan, a Hindi language action thriller film that's directed by Arun Kumar, better known as Atli. While Arun Kumar is best known for his work in Tamil films, this is his first Hindi film. And the movie stars Shah Rukh Khan, who plays a dual role as a jailer of a woman's prison and the jailer's father. And as jailer, Khan embarks on a spree of vigilante justice aimed at quote-unquote righting the social wrongs and highlighting government failings, taking on pollution and industrialism, the inadequacies of the health sector, corruption in defense deals, farmer deaths, amongst other issues as well. And of course, this movie also has a wider political context in the backdrop, which is being very widely discussed as well, that uh, Shah Rukh Khan's son, Aryan, was arrested in Mumbai in 2021 on drug charges, which authorities failed to prove. And the arrest was seen by some as targeting Shah Rukh Khan for his public image as a liberal and a Muslim. This is in the backdrop that was alluded to even promoting the film, which, of course, heightened the attention around its release. That's right, Ritka. And I think um, given this context, people were really interested to watch this movie and to see uh, what kind of messages were going to be given. But um, critics have also been saying that the film doesn't really go far enough. Um, now, we published a review by Anna Vetikard, which makes this point noting that the movie treads with caution and tackles contentious issues, but often with non-specific, safe writing that makes the movie palatable to a mass audience. We will link to that review in our episode notes, so do check that out as well. Now, some of my friends who watched Javan in the cinema agreed that the movie was overly cautious, especially when it came to addressing persecution against religious minorities, which Khan was perhaps uniquely, you know, positioned to do. But they noted that it did make reference to the case of Dr. Kafil Khan in the film, Dr. Khan is a doctor who fought a prolonged legal battle to clear his name after the death of 
dozens of children in Uttar Pradesh when the state ran out of oxygen in 2017. Um, it's quite a well-known case, uh, and it's a clear allusion to that case in the film. But there has also been criticism that, um, you know, the women characters are also only given this illusion of importance while remaining underdeveloped and, you know, remaining on the margins. But still, it is interesting that so many women actors came forward to support Khan in this movie, especially given this backdrop of political persecution which was surrounding the arrest of his son. At the end of the day, though, Jawan appears to be a mass movie that is focused on celebrating Shah Rukh Khan's return to the screen. Now, my friend who watched the movie in the cinema said that the loudest cheer of the night was for the line, before you touch the son, deal with his father. Now, this was, of course, seen as Khan responding to his son's arrest. And on that note, that's it for this episode of South Asia Sphere. Stay tuned for more from us in the coming weeks. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thank you for listening to South Asia Sphere. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Himal South Asian social media channels to make sure you don't miss the next episode. Head to our website, himalmag.com, to see more of Himal's work. And please support our work by becoming a member. Check out our membership plans at himalmag.com slash membership.